Welcome back! So this is an extremely intimidating little diagram that I've drawn on the board, but don't worry, we're going to go through it line by line. But let's talk just a little bit about incubators first, okay? So if you watch the intro video, you've probably gotten to the point where you know that an incubator isn't where you raise chickens. It's where you incubate new ventures, i.e. like coming from an egg. And the concept of incubators isn't that new, but in terms of becoming mainstream, it's pretty new. Um, I've read things about like in Batavia, New York, there was an incubator that was kind of consisting of shared office space in the 1950s, and they look more or less um, similar today, and I'll talk about some of my experiences running an incubator at two different universities as we go through this video, okay? But let's, let's start with some of the stuff we've got here. So what does an incubator actually do? Well, the goal is to build startups, okay? You're probably at the seed stage. In other words, as a venture, maybe you're just an entrepreneurship enthusiast and you've kind of got a vague idea like that generalized aspiration effectuation, or you might have like a clickable demo for your product, or you might even have an MVP or a minimum viable product. So it would be kind of somewhere in there. So you kind of got the idea and you are slowly transitioning into an opportunity or maybe you want to be an entrepreneur with a generalized aspiration and you're still working out that idea, okay? So if that, if that describes you at all, then an incubator might be good for you. And again, you're, build, you're trying to at least kind of start building your business. Now when we talk about a horizontal specialization, it means that you can pretty much be working on any kind of thing and, or any, any kind of specialty and that would be welcome and the incubator. So let me give an example. When I was working in LA, uh, running our incubator there, you know, there were all different kinds of students on campus that came to the incubator with their ideas. I mean, we had people that did tech, we had people that wanted to start their own gym, um, we had people that wanted to start a restaurant, like all sorts of different kinds of things. And all of that was welcome. You know, because of the fact that we're looking at shifting from idea to opportunity, those processes are relatively generic, and so you don't exactly need the tech. tech uh, you don't exactly need the technical experts at that time. Okay? So that's what we mean by horizontal uh, specialization. And of course, there's always exceptions to everything I'm talking about, right? But when we talk about the target, can be individuals, right? That means like an individual student can just kind of come up and say, "Hey, you know, can you help me?" And then, you know, we work with them in usually an entrepreneurship center, which we can also call an incubator if it's on a university campus. Now, it can also be working for teams. Like when I was in L.A., there was a competition called uh, the Mayor's Cup, and so that worked with teams. We took those entrepreneurs with, from kind of like a very generic idea, like I want to solve hunger in Skid Row, and then we helped them to develop it all the way to the minimum viable product so that they could fundraise afterwards. Okay. So again, there's some exceptions. Yeah, we think about it normally as individuals, but it can also be teams. Um, also, we tar look at targeting individuals. You know, my current university, one of the activities that we do in our incubator is preparing students for business pitch competitions. And if you're interested in the pitch methodology, just check out my channel. I've got a whole playlist on how to do an effective business pitch. But again, so there's exceptions. Now, we talk about entrance. Entrance is normally what we call restricted and restricted means that you have to belong to a certain group in order to participate in the activities of the incubator so like at my current university or my prior university you had to be either a student undergraduate student a graduate student or an alum in order to participate in the activities of the incubator now when i ran the incubator i kind of fudged a little bit on the rules, like if you were a university administrator or if you were a faculty member and you wanted to come hang out with us and work with us, I always allowed you in. I never, I never turned anybody away. So, um, you know, again, there's some, there's some little exceptions. Now, there's also corporate in, um, incubators. So a large corporation may also start their own incubator and the idea, um, and there's several reasons you might do this. One, you know, as a corporation that you might start an incubator. One, it's a way to, you know, large bureaucracies, they get kind of stale. So it's a way to kind of inject those entrepreneurial behaviors into a kind of stale corporation. So that's one reason to do it. Another reason is it's very motivating for employees. If an employee feels like that's their baby, they're going to work on that and they're going to enjoy it. And that promotes employee retention. 
you got to remember, one of the biggest costs of any organization of any size is employee turnover. You know, the, the employee leaves, then you've got the opportunity cost, okay, or the transaction cost of going out on the market to find a suitable replacement. You know, that time has an economic value. And then maybe the person you even hire isn't suitable, and that costs even more, right? So this is a way, it's, it's a retention strategy, okay? Now, sometimes there are also incubators that are affiliated with um, cities or towns, right? The city of Los Angeles had uh, some incubators, and you just had to be basically a resident of the city of Los Angeles, very loosely translated in order to participate in that. And I, I worked with uh, that group for a while too. Um, another interesting consulting project I had, I went to New Zealand uh, to a city called Dunedin, and they had an incubator that I guess technically it was restricted because you kind of had to live in the area to, to participate in it. Um, but you know, if you were a mem, if you if you if you were a student or in any way affiliated with the University of Otago, I think that was another school. It was called Otago Polytechnic or something like that. But there were like three universities there. So if you were if you're affiliated with one of those universities in the way you could do it. If you were a resident of the city of Dunedin, you could participate. I mean, it was really pretty much anybody in that city could participate in it. Um, so I guess it's restricted because if you lived in another city, you wouldn't, why would you drive two hours to go? But it wasn't really all that restrictive, right? When we talk about the goal is organic growth. It's getting those brand new ideas that are almost like ex nihilo and then hopefully turning them into something. The training is going to be usually ad hoc. So a lot of these places, these incubators will have an EIR. And EIR, EIR can either be an executive in residence or entrepreneur in residence. It depends on, you know, the abbreviations. And they, and they serve kind of similar functions. So an EIR as an entrepreneur in residence is usually somebody that's seen as a somewhat successful entrepreneur, however you want to define that. and they serve as mentors to these new ventures. Executives and residents are usually successful uh, executives from former corporations. They might be entrepreneurial startups or they might not, but the executive and residents will do more like fundraising. They may have connections for the, the young entrepreneurs. And when I say young entrepreneurs, I mean 18 to 24 year olds. I mean people starting a new venture. Um, so this executive and residents may have connections like, oh, you're working on something with trucking? You know, I've got this buddy and he's a trucking executive. Let me call him. It's that kind of, uh, that kind of role. And so they'll do kind of ad hoc training. Um, they might there might be like a rolling schedule of courses, right? Like you know every Monday we, for three hours we're going to talk about this one topic. And that was something that I did a lot of work up for the diff different incubators um, that were throughout the city of Los Angeles was just going in as a guest speaker to help people like with their business plans or you know kind of whatever just a rolling training schedule. Or the incubator that we had on the university campus, um, we just kind of had consistent classes also but then we would also have special classes like for the mayor's cup competition for a business pitch competition etc so that's what i mean by ad hoc training it might be kind of on a, a somewhat rolling basis kind of depending on what people need what are the needs um or it might be you know very specific to kind of prep you for an event that kind of pops up so um you know how long do you associate with an incubator there's no real answer to that. I mean, if it's a university incubator, you know, as long as you're affiliated with the university, you can usually participate in its services. If you are, you know, a corporate incubator, you know, as long as you work for that company, you know, you can usually partake. You know, if you're like in one of the LA incubators, the one in Dunedin, you know, as long as you're kind of a resident of that city. So, I mean, it could be anywhere from, especially with universities, I mean, you'll have a lot of students that come in, you know, they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. They're really enthusiastic for like a week and then they get burnt out or something and then they never show back up again. So it could be something that's like a few days or a week or it could be something, um, you know, that's like a lifetime kind of a, an association. Um, your contribution, okay, is going to be low. And I mean by a financial contribution. So if you are in an incubator, you probably don't have to pay very much. So if you're part of a university incubator, chances are you really shouldn't be paying anything to participate in the incubator's activities that should be part of your university tuition. That's normally the way it works. Of course, there's exceptions. Maybe there's something special that you're gonna do and um, you know, it's special and therefore you gotta pay a little extra or something like that. But for the most part, you don't pay anything. Um, yeah, and and you, you can normally use the resources of those incubators at free or a very low cost. So in Los Angeles, for example, in our incubator, um, 
you know, we had meals and stuff for the for the students who were coming by, and you know, that was covered by the center's budget or the incubator's budget rather. Um, you know, here where I am in my current university in Texas, we have a 3D printer. Students can use that free of charge. Although if they want to do regular kind of printing like documents, you know, that's tied to their university printer account. But they can come in, they can come and work and brainstorm and all that stuff, and that's totally free, right? Now, if you want to talk about like city-based incubators, um, like I'll give the examples of LA or Dunedin, uh, where I work with some of those. You know, those kinds of incubators, like you normally will have kind of like kind of a fan, it almost, it's very similar to a co-working space model actually. So you'll have some kind of offices and you might pay a little more for that, um, but there might be open access where anybody can come in and just sit like, like on a bar stool or like a very simple setup and you can just come in uh, at any time. And you know, maybe if you pay um, something, it might be to use the printers or um, maybe to, eat the snacks in the vending machine or something like that, right? But it's, it's gonna be very, very low financial contribution. Of course, you know, if you're in a corporate incubator, you know, there won't really, I mean, the corporation should be covering all that because you're, you're part, it's part of your job. And then your compensation is going to be, uh, the compensation from for the incubator, by the way, is normally cost-based, okay? So for example, when I've run the incubators at the university level, I have a budget, and as long as I stay within my budget, there's no problem. Right? I'm not, you know, you don't do this to make money uh, exactly. So um, the city incubators, again, you charge like cost base for the printing, cost base for the office rentals, utilities, et cetera. But again, incubators goals are not exactly to make, you know, money. All right, so what are the, the good things and the bad things about incubators? Well, the good thing is you can go in and as long as you have access to, the, to, to be a member of an incubator, you can go in and pretty much with an open mind, learn all sorts of crazy stuff. Like, hey, I want to help, you know, solve, you know, hunger in Skid Row and maybe don't exactly know how to do that. But you know, there's a lot of networking there and you can talk to people um, and, you, and as you get to know them, you know, you exchange ideas and all that stuff. So you can really help shift from idea to opportunity and hopefully your new venture will grow enough that you can move out of the incubator and go out on your own. Um, there are some incubators that ha are very specific like you can only stay there for nine months to 12 months, um, and then they, then they want you to go out, especially some of these city-run incubators because they don't want people using it as like a permanent office. Um, so that's an advantage, you can meet a lot of people, and by the way, those can be like employees, you know, the hypothetical encounter would be something like, hey, you know, uh, I'm an accountant, and, and uh, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a way that people could do their accounting on the go? Well, I'm an app developer, and I've got an idea. If you can tell me the accounting stuff, I can develop an app, and we can make a lot of money that would be like a productive water cooler kind of conversation, right? So you build some networks. Um, again, especially the ones that are run by cities, you know, you can get access to relatively inexpensive office space because it's subsidized by the city. As a student, what's an advantage of being in your university incubator? Well, they'll usually be faculty mentors and also like an entrepreneur in residence or an exec in residence. And this is a great time to see your faculty in a very are a much less formal way than the way you interact with them in a the classroom. And so you can learn a lot from them. You know, and, and I'll tell you right now, there is nothing that I hate more than having to give students grades. Right? You're already paying tuition, so you've got to have some motivation to be there. But I feel like the grading thing puts a little bit of pressure on students, and maybe they're focusing on completing the assignment versus actually learning the material. But when you go to an incubator, especially on, with, on your university's campus, there's no, I'm not grading anybody when I'm coaching them. I'm, I'm here to help and this is for you. And so you get to interact with me in a very different way. The syllabus is whatever you want out of it. Hey, can you help me with this project? Okay, how can I help you? And then, you know, it's very customized. Um, you know, when you deal with like an exec in residence, you're gonna meet somebody who is very well connected, very powerful, who can help launch your product. If you are dealing with an entrepreneur in residence, again, this is a successful entrepreneur who, you know, ideally is doing this, you know, out of altruism and they want to help people be successful. I mean, that's what I loved about going um, and giving talks at the different incubators in LA and even the one in, D in Dunedin. I mean, these are people who've got real problems and, you know, we can get jazzed up and it's, it's fun and uh, things like that. You know, the, the incubator in Dunedin had a really cool um, program. It's called Jibu, Good, Bad and Ugly, you know, like that Western movie. And, you know, what did you do at the incubator there for Jibu? Well, at the end of the week, it was like from Friday, like, I don't know, from 4 to 7.30 or something, I can't remember. You know, the incubator, um, 
order pizza and they had beers and stuff and everybody sat around a circle and they talked about something that was good bad and ugly about their week and everybody went around and it was really a supportive kind of mechanism so this is really cool um, if you're in a if you're in a corporation you're working on the incubator I mean this is your time to do like that thing you know your boss always says no that can't be done no you can't do that but when you're in the incubator yes you can and if you fail, you're failing on the corporation's dollar. You're not going to lose your mortgage and your marriage because you had a bad idea. Bad idea, quote unquote, right? You're doing it on the corporation's benefit. And if you're successful, you're going to be the next big shot at your company. So that's really cool. Okay. So the disadvantages. Okay. A lot of people like feel like because they got admitted to an incubator, now's the time to celebrate, and then they get lazy. It's like I've already got this office space and a little bit of that pressure is removed. And I saw a lot of this also at Dunedin with their, with their incubator you know, under the Jibu. There was a lot of people in a good, bad, and ugly. And you could tell they hadn't done anything all week. They'd probably just been at the incubator and they'd fooled around on Facebook. You know, they got a little down. It, it, that, that edge kind of is removed, right? Because you've got access to cheap office space and all this other kind of stuff, right? Um, and that can be very dangerous if multiple entrepreneurs kind of fall into that complacency trap. Then you lose the you lose the incubator's network benefits, and it can kind of spread like a contagion. So you have to be careful with that. And I've seen the same thing happen with students. You know, they get kind of Debbie Downer um, about their projects not working well, or maybe they're stressed out for finals, or who knows, right? Uh, these are all bad things. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is you've got to remember some of these execs and residents, um, they're still working their full time corporate job, and maybe they're not there not doing their job. That's really bad. If you are dealing with an entrepreneur in residence. Some of these mentors, you know, you normally do it, of course you get paid for the work. It's, it's, a, it's a consulting fee. Um, but you know you're not gonna make, for the most part, you're not gonna make your living off of being an entrepreneur in residence. Um, so you're doing it because you like the process, you like the experience. Well, you've got a lot of these people that go in there and they're not doing it for altruistic reasons. So they're figuring, well, I'm not making any money as an EIR, so let me try to steal ideas from young entrepreneurs, or let me get on the next big thing, and then I'll just leave this job and leave everybody high and dry. That's a bad thing. And then there's some EIRs that flat out just don't know what they're doing. Uh, interestingly enough, I went to an Academy of Management conference meeting a couple of years ago, and there was a presentation talking about they, and I can't remember if they'd interviewed entrepreneurs and residents at incubators or accelerators. That I can't really remember. But they had interviewed them about their use of the Lean Canvas, and that's, that's a book, the Lean Canvas. And you know, I'll talk more about that on this channel and some other playlists. But um, they interviewed about the use, and it turned out it was like two thirds of these guys, or maybe more, were teaching Lean Canvas, but they hadn't actually read the book, and they didn't really know what they were doing. I mean, so some of these meant, you know, if you have a bad mentor in an incubator, that's a really bad thing. You also have university faculty that have, you know, a full time job at the university, and maybe they're. Um, maybe their field of study isn't entrepreneurship, and so maybe they're not giving you the best guidance, or they're like an exec in residence that's just not there. Um, so these are things that you have to worry about. I remember in LA we had an interview for an EIR, an entrepreneur in residence, and he presented his Lean Canvas stuff. He says, Does anybody have any questions? And I, I said, I've got a question. And he said, What's the question? And I said, I'm sorry, dude, but like, I don't even know what this is supposed to be. Like this has nothing to do with the lean canvas. I, I don't even I don't know what this is. Like this is like totally separate. Like what is this actually? And the guy said something like, "Well, you see, let's see if I can remember how he said. You see, I used to be a paralegal, so unlike other people, I can judge a book by its cover. And so I I read the front and back of it, and I knew all I needed to know about the lean canvas. You know, reading is for you academic types. I'm like, dude, no." And I'll never forget, he was so charismatic and confident when he said it. I remember um, one of these faculty says, yeah, you know, you own the business, don't need to get your act together. This guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, there's an idiot in every crowd, right? So those are some of the downsides of incubators. But again, uh, overall, I think the advantages outweigh the costs. Again, they're so, the, the costs are so low that, um, I think, I think it's something worth doing, right? Cool, so in our next video, we're gonna start talking about accelerators and then also late stage accelerators. As always, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up, that's a like. 
make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the comments down below. In particular, here's a question for you, my YouTube audience. Do you have any experience with incubators? Uh, good, bad, or ugly, right? If you do, make sure you post them. Awesome, I'm looking forward to seeing you in my next video.